there are a lot of conferences and everyone gives lectures and data, but this is one of a kind where you go in hands on using the new technology, experimenting it, getting a feel for the technology and learning hands on exactly how these procedures are done and why this technology is so important. The ISCVS uh, symposium that we are holding here at Methodist Hospital in Houston, Texas is the largest hands on symposium in a variety of interventions in the world. It has not been done or achieved anywhere else. This is uh, something that's so unique because we have here state-of-the-art technology, the newest uh, innovations in endovascular field to uh, train and teach physicians how to use and implement this to provide better patient care. Having such a great wealth of resources and having different x-ray techs at every station, having all of the equipment available to do the jobs that we wanted to do, it was really a great opportunity. It was like having a big endovascular playground where you could test out all of the different equipment in a controlled environment. As a physician assistant, being able to work with the different surgeons and really grow my depth of experience has been a great opportunity. Well, there's certain things that, I, that you can't learn in the classroom and, and uh, obviously when you're working as a clinician, the, the mistakes are costly. So here you can, you can experiment with the devices, you can try things you've never tried. Uh, you have experts kind of guiding you and, and, and giving you advice as to uh, how to deal with, with, with complications and the procedures. And, and that's always what I'm looking for. I'm always looking to, to increase my speed of learning and, and, uh, and, and content. Uh, and I think that this hands-on approach is very effective for it. Welcome to the DeBakey Education Studios. This is Dr. Deepan Shaw, and uh, you're here today for our CV Live series with our guest, Dr. Faisal Nabi, who will be presenting on uh, evaluation of the patient with chest pain, choosing the right test at the right time. Uh, we'll also be doing live questions and uh, via Poll Everywhere. So if you have any questions, please visit pollev.com slash DeBakey or you can text your questions to DeBakey at 37607. Please also follow us on social media at DeBakeyCVEDU, on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So uh, I'm very pleased to have with us today Dr. Faisal Nabi. Faisal is Assistant Professor of Medicine at uh, Houston Methodist and Weill Cornell. Uh, Faisal is uh, a truly a multimodality imaging expert uh, he has uh, training and practices actively in cardiac MRI, cardiac CT, nuclear cardiology, uh, as well as echocardiography. So uh, as we have today a, a number of different tests uh, at our uh, option for evaluation of patients with chest pain, uh, Faisal is going to try to walk us through how do we choose uh, which test for any given patient. So welcome Faisal, pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much Dr. Shah. Uh, good evening. Um, so as uh, Dipin had mentioned, uh, my goal is to help you navigate through this very complex um, testing that we can do for chest pain. So in uh, 2020, we have a lot of different tests at our, at our disposal which we can order for chest pain. And on your screen, you'll see these are um, a, a lot of the different types of tests available to us um, here at Houston Methodist. And as a physician, I know this can become very difficult sometimes to choose between these tests. And my job today is hopefully to share some tips and tricks that I have in order to 
help navigate and choose the best test for uh, your patient. So I thought I would begin with a, um, a general outline of how, how I wanted to proceed. I think, you know, before we get into um, evaluation of chest pain with tests, it's important to know whom to test. And so we'll discuss a little bit about that. Um, after that, the next biggest thing that I believe is important when it comes to evaluating chest pain is as a physician ordering a test, you're going to have to make a decision. Are, will you choose a test that evaluates anatomy or will you choose a test which evaluates physiology? And we'll go um, more into that. And then we'll go a little bit into what we need to consider uh, prior to ordering either of those chests, wh tests, whether it's an anatomical test or a physiological test. And then I thought we'd go into two different clinical scenarios after that, where these uh, two uh, methodologies have now been tested head to head, and we can go over some real trial data um, that is out there in the literature. And then unfortunately, um, maybe, you know, um, we live in a time right now where COVID is a very hot topic, and we can discuss a little bit about uh, if you have a patient um, with COVID-19 um, who's stable and needs some chest pain, some general uh, imaging criteria. So, um, uh, dip in with that, I'll get going. Um, first thing is, um, I think it's very important to figure out whom should we test. So, um, this is just a nice table that uh, most people have, are aware um, about, um, which pretty much shows you that your uh, post-test probability of your test very much is dependent on your pre-test probability. So if you have a, a patient who you ha very strongly consider to have coronary artery disease, it is very unlikely that obtaining a stress test is going to move the needle very much. Um, in fact, if you have a normal study in this patient, this could very likely be um, a false negative uh, test. And similarly, um, if you have a patient who you expect to have a very low probability of having coronary artery disease, it would be unlikely then if you had a positive test that this patient um, truly uh, did indeed have CAD and rather this test is more than likely a false positive test. And so really when it comes to imaging and the impact of imaging for a patient with um, um, CAD, potential CAD, it's really patients who are intermediate risk and who we want to test. Because in the intermediate risk population, these are the patients where a positive or negative test really helps you differentiate whether your patient potentially has coronary artery disease. So the next question becomes, what do we mean by intermediate test? So intermediate risk patients. So um, published, um, a, you know, a couple of things that go into, and, and this can be very easily done. Uh, th this is not hard to do to figure out who is an intermediate risk. There are a couple of criteria that go into, that you should look at. You look at the age, gender, and you can look at the chest pain quality. And Diamond Forrester have published this um, um, a few decades ago now where just looking at these three characteristics, their, a person's age, their gender, and the, whether they have typical chest pain, what we describe as substernal, brought on by exertion, relieved with either rest or nitroglycerin. Um, based on these three characteristics, you can very quickly identify patients who are either low, intermediate, or high risk. On top of that, another very important facet that we should also take into consideration is risk factors because we could have patients who have uh, minimal risk factors, I mean, I'm sorry, minimal, uh, 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 what we consider um, atypical chest pains, but who have the typical risk factors uh, that we're all used to seeing. And um, studies have shown that if you have at least one risk factor, you instantly become an intermediate risk patient. So patients we should consider testing are those who, you know, we should look at their age, their gender, their chest pain, characteristics and definitely if they have any risk factors they become intermediate risk. This is really where your testing will have um, the most value. The next consideration I believe that has to go uh, to be, uh, have very early on that we have to consider is what kind of stress test are, in broad categories are you going to end up choosing for your patient with chest pain. 
Are you going to choose the traditional functional stress test where you are looking at the hemodynamic effect of possible obstructive coronary artery disease? These are tests such as your stress EKG, your nuclear myocardial perfusion studies, your stress car MRI, and your stress echocardiography. They all involve some sort of um, imaging modality to detect ischemia. The other test that now has been has developed within the last decade or, uh, or more is an anatomical test, and that is CT coronary angiography. And a lot of institutions, I'm sure, are, act, uh, have, are now using this test um, in patients because of a lot of new data that has come out, and we'll go over some of that. So I f feel this is one of the very first questions that in your mind you have to evaluate whether you will choose an anatomical test or, or, or physiological test. And of course, if you need some guidance, both of them give you different types of information. The anatomical test gives you more morphology of the coronary arteries. So you'll be able to see the thorax, you'll be able to see your coronary arteries, you'll be able to assess plaque, where the plaque is located, and you'll be able to make assessments of stenosis um, uh, severity. Depending on uh, the techniques that are available at your institution, you may not be necessarily able to um, assess what the hemodynamic consequence of the stenosis you are seeing with anatomical tests. With functional tests, you get a different group of information. With functional tests, remember we are, de we are detecting ischemia. So this is our, these tests are very good in localizing ischemia, quantifying the severity of the ischemia, and being able to tell you the function of the heart both at rest and post-stress. Some of the techniques like MRI and echocardiography allow you to also evaluate other causes of chest pain. And this includes um, causes that, conditions that affect the pericardium, the aorta, or maybe even valvular heart disease. So as we dwell a little bit further into this, let's do a talk a little bit about, and, and then I want to keep it general right now so to, to bring everyone you know, on the same page as we move forward. So let's talk a little bit about anatomical imaging. And this is a classic CTA um, that many of y'all have seen. You can see we get morphological uh, images of the chest um, in the axial, sagittal, and coronal views. You're able to see a, a large field of view, very, very high spatial resolution. And then you're able to actually investigate the coronary arteries individually. And I hope you appreciate in, these, in this uh, study here that these coronary arteries are completely normal coronary arteries. There's no evidence of atherosclerosis and there's no evidence of any coronary artery stenosis. And what's beautiful about this technique is that it has been shown in the literature as to be probably the, high, the technique with the highest sensitivity for coronary artery disease. So what does that mean? That means you will be able to always accurately detect coronary artery disease and as a result, it has a very high negative predictive value. That if we tell you this test is normal, you can be certain that your patient does not have coronary artery disease. Limitations of this test are what I had mentioned uh, previously, would be in a scenario such as this, where you see a stenosis, it can very nicely show you that this is probably in the proximal mid-segment of the vessel. You can see it's a non-calcified plaque. And if you were reading this stenosis, I'm sure you would call this either a moderate or a moderate severe stenosis. But in the end, we know there's a big discrepancy between anatomy and physiology, and you're left wondering what is the hemodynamic consequence of this lesion. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, how we can get around that. The other thing to consider about uh, CTA is that it requires iodinated contrast, and with that, you have to have patients who have um, good renal function in order to um, uh, participate in this test uh, because of the risk of contrast-induced nephropathy. So, Baza, let me ask you, what do you use as a criteria for when you think it's uh, safe to give uh, iodinated contrast? Wh what's your cutoff in your lab for uh, creatinine or GFR? In our lab, we've been using either a creatinine greater than 1.5 or a GFR less than 60. 
if a patient does meet that in general, we're requesting some sort of uh, a renal evaluation in order to protect the kidneys if the, um, if the, uh, the test is indicated mm -hmm. and the risks outweigh the benefits. Yeah. Okay. The benefits outweigh the risks. So let's move on then to the other category of testing, which is, of course, functional testing. This is testing I think most of us um, have grown up with and are very familiar with. But I want to just break it down a little bit further because it'll become very important how do you want to think about it when you're deciding to choose um, a particular type of, of functional test. So we know that a stress test is composed of two things. You have to have a stressor, be this an exercise or um, a, a pharmacological um, a stressor. Um, and then you need, once you've created flow discrepancy between normal and abnormal arteries, you need some technique that is able to detect the flow discrepancy um, on the ischemic cascade, be it perfusion or wall motion. So you need an imaging test that is able to identify ischemia. And this is all the different types of tests that you guys have um, very well uh, been accustomed to. This includes echo, nuclear, which includes both SPECT and PET, um, a CT perfusion and uh, CMR perfusion. And together, when you have uh, the ability to stress your patient plus the ability to detect ischemia, you have the stress test, which, as we know, is very powerful in being able to identify CAD, quantify the degree of um, a severity of the abnormality, and then able to estimate prognosis. Now, <coughs> because, it's, because of how I, I want you all to think about it, if you are choosing a functional test, the first decision you're going to have to make is what kind of stressor am I going to use? And here, I think the most important point that I'd like to take for everyone to take away is that if you can, if the patient can, is if the patient does not have any limitations, nothing beats exercise. Exercise is the preferred mode of stress testing. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Number one, you're able to actually observe them dur um, during stress, uh, a, st a stressful condition. Uh, you can observe their functional capacity. You can assess them for symptoms. You're monitoring them with blood pressure and EKG. And of course, you have the ability to look for arrhythmias. So whenever we can, we really need them to exercise. And a proper test is to be able to read at least 85% of your maximal predicted heart rate. Unfortunately, um, just the nature of the field um, that we have with our patient populations, Unfortunately, a lot of patients aren't able to exercise, and there's a lot of reasons for this. They could be inpatients in the hospital. Uh, they are, have um, orthopedic issues, either back, knee, hips, which not, do not allow them to be able to exercise, or they have medical comorbidities where exercise may not be the safest thing. And that includes severe degrees of aortic stenosis, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, or having uh, abdominal aneurysms. Furthermore, a lot of these patients may have very abnormal EKGs, and if you have a patient who you're not performing imaging with, you can imagine that if you already have baseline STT changes, it'll be very difficult to interpret your stress EKG. A lot of patients who come to our labs also have, our, uh, have arrhythmias, ongoing arrhythmias. These could be atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, and there, again, it's recommended to, to have pharmacological testing or they may simply already be diagnosed with coronary artery disease or be on medications um, uh, for hypertension that include beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, nitrates. These are all drugs that mask um, uh, ischemia but also prevent your heart rate from increasing and so would not be a best test for patients um, with, um, uh, for exercise. And then oftentimes we have patients who are sick, with low ejection fractions, who've had recent myocardial infarctions. Again, exercise may not be the best test. And for these patients, you're going to choose a pharmacological test. So that brings you to the next decision tree. If you are choosing a, 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 a functional test and you have a patient who is unable to exercise, and you are choosing a, ph um, a pharmacological stress test, you now have to choose which pharmacological stress, how you want to uh, stress these patients. Now, I will tell you, um, I think 
with um, the um, with the availability of regadenosine, which is a pure A2A, um, A2A agonist, really I think most labs nowadays are doing vasodilator stress, and specifically with regadenosine because of its um, uh, low side effect profile. However, traditionally we do have two ways of pharmacologically stressing patients. This includes a chronotropic response where you increase their uh, rate pressure product uh, with agents such as dibutamine. Obviously, you can imagine uh, where you're causing the heart to actively increase in inotropy and chronotropy, conditions where they, you may not want to consider this test. Uh, uh, consider dibutamine would be patients who already have accelerated hypertension, who are already having arrhythmias or at risk for arrhythmias, who have advanced degrees of aortic stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and those who in general are un with presenting with unstable symptoms. And that therefore then leaves the, uh, us to uh, vasodilator stresses, which again, I think most labs uh, prefer to do now. And those are, our, we have three drugs in this category, dipyridamol, adenosine, and regadenosine. Uh, adenosine and dipyridamol both affect, uh, affect all the adenosine receptors and therefore have a lot of side effects. Uh, regadenosine um, uh, is affects specifically uh, the A2A receptor, which is responsible for coronary vasodilation. But conditions that you should think about, which maybe even these agents would not be appropriate for, would include um, the like, such as advanced, a patient who may have advanced AV block, who is actively bronchospastic and is wheezing, um, who is hypotensive, or of course because um, uh, these uh, caffeine um, is a competitive, um, uh, uh, is a, 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 a works competitively to bind to the same sites as uh, these vasodilator agents. Obviously, if your patient has caffeine on board, uh, you may not be able to get a successful. Uh, uh, maximal pharmacological stress test. So patient, caffeine is a big deal in our labs. We really try to hold caffeine for more than 12 hours. Just let me ask you there though, in the real world, patient shows up <clears throat> for their vasodilator stress test and says I had a small cup of coffee at five o'clock in the morning. What are you gonna do? And they, they, do, they drove two hours to come to your lab. Yeah, this is a, a condition that is um, unfortunately not uncommon and always puts us in a bind. Um, uh, you know, the scenario here is where we really need to do some, stre some sort of um, stress test. And in this patient, I would pr probably go with rest imaging. For if we were to do myocardial perfusion imaging uh, with uh, uh, nuclear agents, I would proceed with a rest imaging first. It would allow us time, f hopefully, for this agent to wear out further and then do stress as the second test. Uh, if you have the ability to convert to a different test, then you can uh, consider considering to the moving on maybe to an anatomical test instead mm -hmm. if the physician agrees. Um, and then although we don't like to use it, there is uh, dibutamine, uh, but dibutamine of course has a, 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 lar a much larger side effect profile. Mm -hmm. All right, so once you've considered uh, what sort of stress, how you will stress your patient, then of course this is where the challenge comes, is now deciding what imaging test are you going to choose, the imaging test that's going to detect the ischemia. And uh, you know, I think why, uh, the very first, uh, you know, what are items that you should consider? I think there's three very important items you should consider. I think probably most important item is you have to see what's available in your area uh, and see what technology is available, your hospital, your outpatient clinic has, and what, your local ex uh, what the local expertise is when it comes to interpretation of these studies. I will talk, uh, of course, and that will very quickly limit which tests you're doing, but I will talk in more general terms um, as to, you know, if you had all these tests available, such as as we do here at Houston Methodist, how you can maybe figure, tease apart further more, um, you know, which patient would be better for which test. So I think the next thing after, to dis uh, after you've figured out what is available to you is to figure out what are your patient characteristics? You know, what are, what, what are features of your patient which would either push you towards one test or away from another? 
So for example, is your patient obese or have COPD? We know in these conditions, um, it can be very difficult to have good acoustic windows with echocardiography, especially if you're not using contrast. So maybe in this test, echocardiography would not be the best test. We also know when it comes to myocardial perfusion imaging that in the patients with obesity, at least with SPECT, you can also have uh, uh, difficulty with attenuation. And I would say that if you had availability um, of any test, at least patients who are big, you know, one really should consider, depending on their size, uh, one really should consider either cardiac MRI, if they can fit in through the bore, uh, if their chest circumference allows them to fit in the bore of the scanner, or for sure PET, where you can really get, because they use attenuation correction, um, you can really get around um, uh, the attenuation issues um, with obesity. The other characteristic to look for is claustrophobia. Some of our tests are longer, some are shorter. Some patients cannot, do not like, they feel like they're in a coffin. And you know, tests such as um, uh, uh, MRI and maybe even some of the perfusion techniques with PET or SPECT can be difficult for your patient and, uh, and not well tolerated. Another thing to consider is of course renal function. Um, most tests, at, at least the most myocardial perfusion tests Imaging tests uh, you really don't have to consider creatinine. The only test where you do, of course, would be cardiac MRI. In patients who have GFRs less than 30, there is the risk of nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. So if you were to consider MRI, uh, do keep in mind renal function because contrast is used, gadolinium contrast. Um, so along with MRI, if your patient has implantable cardiac devices, a lot of sites are not imaging patients uh, with implantable devices, and that would quickly uh, exclude that test. Here at Methodist, we are imaging patients with implantable devices. If your patient has known CAD, sometimes uh, perfusion techniques are easier than wall motion uh, techniques uh, and are simpler for your patient as well. You have to consider a lot of these patients have, um, um, you know, are, have repeated testing. Radiation is also an issue. You know, if you, you know, we have techniques that have very low, have low or no radiation. PET has much lower radiation than all the other uh, myocardial. I mean, I'm sorry, than all the nuclear techniques, and of course, CMR has zero radiation. And then the other thing you should also consider is maybe in your patient you want to evaluate more than just the coronaries. You may be looking for non-cardiac causes of chest pain. And so that would include, you know, do you need a study that helps you uh, evaluate the pericardium, the aorta, or the valves? And then you would be leaning to tests such as cardiac MRI and echocardiography, which allow you to do that and give you um, um, concomitant information um, to, to more than just perfusion imaging. Finally, once you have had the opportunity to now think about what type of stress you're doing, then go on to consider what kind of stress test uh, you're going to do based on your patient characteristics. I'll make your job easier. I don't think you have to worry too much about test characteristics, and I, I will go into that specifically. Here, what I mean by that is, how do these tests in all individually fare when it comes to diagnostic accuracy between them? And what are the pro about prognostic information? And I can tell you, and I've just show you uh, a couple of slides on this. Uh, this is you know, a large meta-analysis. There's many different papers out there. This is just one that I chose. But what I want to you all to take away is in general, um, the, you know, the most sensitive test for detection of coronary artery disease, probably the most, is uh, cardiac CTA. This is very closely followed by both cardiac MRI and cardiac PET. Uh, both these techniques have shown uh, to have be, be very high in sensitivity. And when it comes to specificity, techniques that are generally um, uh, are, have a higher diagnostic uh, uh, specificity are tests that assess wall motion. So um, I won't go too much about this, but in general, most of these tests perform very well and are congruent with each other, uh, other than what I have told y'all. And when it comes to prognostic information, again, there's 
slide after slide I can show you for all of these different imaging techniques, be it PET or MRI, I've shown you here just SPECT and CTA, showing you that in general, if you say a study is normal, patients truly do well in the long run, and as the severity of the abnormality increases, um, um, the, the, the incidence of having an event increases. So, and, we'll, and these are just, you know, uh, two papers uh, showing that. So, um, this was, I hope, a good general introduction of, uh, you know, um, what to consider and how to consider when we're choosing a stress test and how I think about it um, in my own practice when I'm uh, confronted with a patient with chest pain. Um, I will, we can save the questions for? Yeah, we'll, we'll save the question till the end. Okay. So I thought, you know, why don't we see what the literature has to say? So, you know, there's probably two very common situations um, we have, uh, the acute chest pain in the emergency department, as well as the outpatient stable chest pain patient, and then one we are all grappling with and probably many different ways to handle it and, you know, that can be open for discussion. So I thought I'd uh, tackle three common, t uh, two common scenarios and one a little bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. All right, so what about acute chest pain? So just for, you know, setting up the scenario, here was a 60-year-old male, uh, you know, presents to the emergency department with acute chest pain. You know, he has one risk factor for dyslipidemia. His vital signs are completely normal. EKG is completely normal. Troponin is normal. Labs are normal. Chest x-ray normal. And this patient is in your emergency department, and you have, and you're, you, you know, you are, it, I'm, if, if you're in the United States, more than likely this patient is going to get some sort of uh, a, a testing done prior to their departure. So the question becomes is, you know, what should we do? Now traditionally, as you know, most of these patients are generally admitted to an observational unit. There is a serial EKGs and troponins that are performed. If those are normal, f likely the following morning, they're going for your traditional functional tests that we have spent a lot of time already sp speaking about. And this, of course, includes stress echo and stress nuclear. And again, depending on your availability, depending on um, uh, your individual patient characteristics. And what the data and literature has shown that these tests are excellent, they work. They will detect disease, they have a very high diagnostic accuracy, they have a very high negative predictive value that if we tell you the test is normal, you can be confident that when you send this patient home from the emergency room, they are not um, going to suffer an ill event in a, uh, in, in, in a short period of time. But um, the discussion for us today is can we do anything better? Because as you know in the emergency room, literature from many different sites has shown that a lot of these patients have normal studies, and in fact, it can be uh, greater than 90 to 95 percent in studies that are performed um, in the ED for ED setting for acute chest pain are completely normal. So we have to the, we have to balance the ability to you know test these patients uh, rapidly, but also quickly decide you know um, who can be discharged home in a timely manner. Uh, without occupying too many hospital uh, resources. And as we know, in a lot of our emergency departments, uh, CTA is readily available. And instead of maybe putting a patient in the observational unit and doing our traditional route, what if we were to do cardiac CT straight in the emergency department? And believe it, uh, there has been now at least four different studies totaling close to 2,000 patients that have looked at the use of CTA, comparing it to standard of care, and standard of care being your traditional functional test uh, that as a clinician you, cl clinician you use. Most of these studies have uh, a short-term follow-up because the goal is to make sure these patients can, are, 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 if they, uh, are, can you, you can discharge these patients safely and that they can make it safely to their physician for further care. Mm 
And most of them, if you look at their inclusion and exclusion criteria, are really low to intermediate risk pa patient populations. These are patients who are not having active dynamic EKG changes. They are not patients who are having positive troponins. Um, there are, uh, you know, patients which have, um, who are generally stable and with normal EKGs and troponins. And this is just a, a, a large, um, uh, this was a, a, a nice meta-analysis that was put together of all the different studies. And what you'll see is that if you use a CTA strategy, because it's avail readily available and because it literally is no more a than a five to 10 minute test, you can very, very rapidly come up to a diagnosis. In fact, the time to diagnosis in these studies ranged on average from 50% faster to almost 75% faster. So obviously, if you are coming up with an answer quicker for your patient, this means less time for your patient in the hospital. Less time in the hospital means less hospital resources, and this translates di directly into lower ED costs. But the beauty of this was also that, um, in general, all, uh, there was a, not only was CT faster, but also in general that um, in this patient population, again, low to intermediate risk, if uh, compared to a standard of care approach, there was no difference in heart outcomes such as death or myocardial infarction. So it was very reassuring that using CT was safe and that it can lead to a faster uh, turnaround of your patient. And we actually studied this ourselves um, in a study that we did where we looked at 600 patients and randomized them between CTA and standard of care in our uh, institution, which was SPECT imaging. And if you just look at the first two uh, graphs, you can see that uh, CTA imaging was uh, much faster than uh, SPECT imaging. And in our study, we did not necessarily do these patients immediately from the emergency room. There were patients who were admitted overnight and performed first thing in the morning. So this may be more of uh, for institutions that you know, uh, uh, may not necessarily have uh, radiology performing these tests in the middle of the night. This can be reassuring that even if you choose a CT strategy where you'll come in the following morning, it still will be a faster technique. Uh, than a lot of other stress tests. So Faisal, let me stop you there and ask you a question. So this is CTA. Now we know that uh, a lot of the patients that come into the ED are really low to low intermediate risk patients. Uh, and in those patients, what about just uh, if the calcium score is zero? <laughs> can you stop right there? That's a great question, uh, Dipin. And uh, you know, there has been now a lot, many public, uh, well, there have been uh, at least 2,000 patient uh, publications in the literature which have shown that uh, this possibly could be a very safe technique. Now, um, there is no study that has shown it to where you prospectively had a calcium score and sent the patient home. And the difficulty I know we've had at our own institution incorporating this is that the standard of care um, is moving the standard of care and saying that this could be a reasonable test. But at least in the low to intermediate risk population, um, uh, and data from se several different sites has shown that this could be a new gatekeeper yeah. and definitely needs to be investigated further. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question here before, before we move on to the, to the uh, COVID aspects. Here's a question, I guess, from the audience or from the, somebody texted in. Uh, how do you train young cardiac surgeon in interpreting coronary angiography to be able to perform the best cabbage? Any advice? And I presume what they mean is maybe integrating the coronary angiographic findings as well as the other non-invasive imaging findings in, in determining the best cabbage approach. Okay. Um, I will try to a answer this, what I think maybe where the f person is going. In general, when it comes to a patient with bypass, why do we use CTA? Uh, and the way I've seen it is for two reasons. Number one, it can be very difficult to evaluate the native coronary arteries. In patients who have bypassed, these native coronary arteries tend to, uh, uh, calcification tends to accelerate and uh, you can have a very, very difficult time at least appreciating 
uh, evaluating the proximal mid segments because all you see is calcium and the blooming artifact. Where CT can be helpful is in a patient with bypass is evaluating um, the bypass grafts and in those patients who may be going for redo surgery, evaluating the vessel distal to the graft as long as it's of reasonable size, and I mean more than greater than two millimeters, and to be able to see where that bypass graft is in re reference to your sternum. How much room does the surgeon have um, uh, uh, with his blade or his saw um, in order to protect, you know, actually right. transecting uh, the, the bypass graft? So that's how I've seen it in patients, um, what do you call it, uh, who have bypass and are going for redo surgery. If the, f if the, if the uh, person who asked the question is referring to, do we use CTA and then decide you know, uh, to for bypass, you know, I will uh, still in that, uh, my personal opinion is I still think we need invasive cornea angiography. Yes, there are situations where, you know, maybe your patient is unable to go for invasive cornea angiography and we've all had patients where we've done our best um, uh, to interpret uh, uh, the arteries and make some recommendations of where grafts can be landed. Okay, we got another question here. It says, what is the radiologic exam which makes it possible to specify the state of the wall of the mammary arteries before cabbage? So I think this is getting to the point you were saying, which is, uh, I presume it's trying to identify uh, before cabbage uh, if somebody has adequate uh, mammary uh, arteries that can be utilized as, as arterial conduits. Yeah. So for our surgeons, we can definitely image uh, all the, uh, you know, um, any, you know, graft that they are interested in uh, imaging to take a look at. So we can see both the IMAs, uh, we can assess their patency, their quality, their size. Uh, we can look at the different grafts. We can make sure where they are in reference to the sternum um, um, and, and really give our advice, uh, surgeon advice as to where grafts are, and I should mention also even the RV, because we know that oftentimes we see the RV even stuck to the sternum. Yeah. So I think those are situations where we use it. Yeah, so I mean, I think CTA is actually very good. It's actually a very good test for, for uh, assessing the patency and the, the character of the, the internal mammary arteries as well. Absolutely. Here's another question mm. from the audience. It says, uh, in our hospital setting, we see a lot of patients who've been thrombolyzed from uh, acute myocardial infarction at a peripheral healthcare facility. They present to us two or three days later. Uh, what's the best test for these patients, uh, I presume, to determine if thrombolysis has been successful? Uh, functional testing or uh, coronary angiography? Right, so th this is a good, good question as well. and. Um, I think maybe, uh, tell me if I'm taking this the right way, I think maybe he's referring to now assessing whether you have viability. Yeah, and I wonder if it's, it's either viability or success of thrombolysis. Okay. Or residual ischemic burden. Okay. I would, uh, in a patient who has, a, you know, if you're trying to assess, you know, obviously I think, um, what is this? Well, if you've had a patient and they've appeared to have successful thrombolysis and you still want to be able to assess um, um, what their, um, I think, to be honest with you, I think nowadays most patients are going to the lab. They want to know whether there's any high risk anatomy such as left main or uh, three, uh, severe three vessel proximal disease. Uh, if there is a situation where you know the already the anatomy and you want to know if there's any remnant ischemia, then of course you can choose any of the uh, tests um, uh, based on your patient characteristics and test availability um, as to uh, for detecting ischemia. If you're f wondering um, in some of these cases if the patient has already had a large infarct, they've already queued out, you know, the wall, um, you, they may then, the next, uh, and you've taken them to the lab and, you know, the wall is not moving and you see a tight lesion. In that situation, maybe then, you know, the question becomes about viability. And then we have um, tests that we, uh, we feel, you know, cardiac MRI and cardiac PET really are the two best tests uh, for viability imaging. All right. So let me um, 
you know, we talked uh, a fair bit about CT and, and really about anatomy and, and the, the strength of CT is anatomic assessment. Uh, what about physiology by CT? How good is that? Okay, uh, I'm glad you asked that, uh, Dipin, and if you don't mind, if we go to the next case, I will sure. work that into okay. the talk. All right. <laughs> okay, so now let's move on to, that's kind of data that has compared um, functional testing to um, uh, CTA in the ED setting. What do we know in the outpatient setting? And this is a setting that we are all familiar with. Uh, this was a 66-year-old female. She came into our clinic, uh, has a history of hypertension, hip arthritis, and has been having what sounds like typical uh, stable chest pain. Her pain isn't worse, but it gets worse with exertion, you know, um, sometimes. Um, and, and she's in your office with completely stable hemodynamics, normal labs, and again, an uneventful EKG or chest X-ray. And again, as a clinician, you uh, have the, uh, you, you know, uh, you, you, you have, uh, most of us have been, uh, uh, fun I mean, uh, testing in a certain way. And um, what does, the, what can we learn from uh, data in the literature as to how we can approach these patients and maybe learn um, um, some new tricks? So um, one trial that really uh, has looked at this, um, a large trial, two trials actually published, one I'll mention in detail, is the PROMISE trial. This looked at 10,000 patients. They were randomized who had stable chest pain, randomized to a strategy of anatomical testing with CTA versus a functional test. And here they included both uh, mostly stress nuclear and stress echo. And then they followed these patients out to 12 months. Um, minimum and the median follow-up in this trial was out to almost two years. And what you'll learn is um, and their primary endpoint was death, myocardial infarction, unstable angina, and may, uh, uh, major complications. And what you'll learn is that d regardless of the um, strategy you choose, be it a functional test, versus a uh, test that, uh, uh, versus an anatomical test such as CTA. In general, your patients did well with both techniques and there was no difference in outcome for these hard endpoints that they mentioned. So, um, um, so this was very reassuring, um, at, at least to the CT community, that if you were to use an, a CT-based anatomical approach, at least you would not be hurting anyone by pr using this strategy. And this was also shown uh, in the Scott Hart trial. This was another trial that also randomized between CT and functional testing. You can see the absolute event rates in both studies were low. Um, um, that, and so telling you that this was most likely, again, an intermediate risk population. And that in both studies, whether you used a functional test versus an anatomical test, the, um, that, you know, there was really no difference when it came to testing strategies in predicting the primary endpoint. So I think very uh, reassuring information. But let me share with you, uh, Dipin, one aspect of um, a CT where I think may definitely has an advantage over other tests. And um, this is uh, just an example of this patient. Uh, our patient, I, he, this was my patient, I sent them for a CTA. Here is our, you know, the axial slices through the chest wall. This is just a volume rendered 3D reconstruction of this. And then, you know, we post-process uh, this data set and um, I, I just bring this out to show you that this can really be done with very low radiation um, if you have uh, a f you know, uh, the right technology uh, with minimal contrast use. Um, um, and you know, once you reconstruct, when, once you reprocess these images, you can really take a detailed look of the cornea anatomy. And what I want to show you is um, in this particular case, this again was a patient of mine, you can see here in the RCA and the left circumflex, which were uh, the arteries, uh, which are the two panels in the middle and on the uh, right side of the screen, you have completely normal arteries. But if you look at the left coronary artery, you will appreciate a, a non-calcified plaque there in the proximal segment. And, um, and this was, um, 
uh, is, is both a blessing for us because we are able to identify disease and plaque and the location, but at the same time, depending on what you have available for you, can make in, add, another, uh, add some complexity. Because this was read out as a moderate lesion, and, uh, and as you know, CTA is a test that does not necessarily um, uh, by itself look at the hemodynamic consequence of that lesion. And so here I've uh, pointed out to you those uh, two uh, lesions. Um, and this is just a point that I want to make is that really CT is the only test out there that really tells you whether you have atherosclerosis, the extent of your atherosclerosis, and what kind of atherosclerotic plaque you have. And um, it is important to know what kind of atherosclerotic plaque you have. Uh, literature and data has shown us there are plaque characteristics that are high risk. And what do I mean by high risk? If you have a plaque that's very fatty, which has a, a, a Hounsfield unit less than 30, if you have spotty calcification within that plaque, if you have positive remodeling of the vessel and um, what we call a napkin ring sign, these are plaque characteristics that have studies have gone on to show that these predict ischemia and also have been shown to predict acute coronary syndromes. So identifying atherosclerotic plaque uh, by CTA is beneficial because you have the opportunity to begin an intervention uh, which you may not necessarily be able to do with other tests. And so do I have any evidence for that? Well, these are just some you know, uh, uh, you know, promising um, data from four randomized clinical trials which looked at patients who had CTA versus standard of care. And in those patients who had the CT strategy, it is assumed because plaque was seen that these patients had very aggressive medical intervention, both blood pressure control, smoking cessation, diabetes control, and of course statin therapy, that these trials have shown that there was almost a 31% reduction in uh, uh, myocardial infarction. So this test can make a meaningful difference by detecting plaque and being your ability to um, act upon that plaque. But of course the difficulty is, if you look at this uh, coronary that I've shown you is, what do I do with that lesion? Do I now, and, and this goes along to your question, Dipin, is, you know, if I have a CTA and I have a moderate lesion, am I, you know, do I, am I now doing a, am I back to a functional mm -hmm. test? I did see a plaque, I am going to treat with statins, but you know, do I uh, go on to a functional test? And yes, that, that is a limitation. You know, a lot of sites will be choosing a functional test to assess the hemodynamic um, uh, you know, consequence of uh, this obstructive lesion. Now, um, there is a, a new uh, player, uh, um, and that's a CTFFR. Uh, this is a, a technique that looks, it looks at computational flow dynamics and its ability and is able to predict an FFR uh, for you. And we have this technology here at Methodist. We were able to apply it to this particular patient. And here I got an intermediate value, which is 0 0.76. Um, I knew where this uh, lesion was. Um, you know, I, I felt comfortable the patient's symptoms were stable. And um, I elected, based on this result, to hold off on anything further, and I pursued very aggressive medical management and we've been following this patient closely. Right. Uh, if they show any instability, we can always you know, proceed to invasive coronary angiography. So, so let me probe you a little bit more on the CTFFR. And you know, the case you showed here was a nice case where there's a non-calcified soft plaque. You don't have any of the, the blooming artifact from calcium. My question, I guess, is there any data on how good CTFFR, the, the, the accuracy maybe with comparison to invasive FFR? in patients who have heavily calcified vessels? Yeah, so there is some studies out there looking at very, very heavily calcified vessels, and you're right, I believe it is a limitation now. Uh, if you have vessels that are, I, I can't give you an exact calcium score, but as the, the more severity of the calcium you have, there, it, it, this can be um, a, a difficulty with modeling using this technique. Yeah. 
Okay, so we've, uh, we've got a question here. It's a little bit different than the, the, you know, the specific uh, scenarios you were talking about, but the question is, uh, what do you do with a patient who presents late after a myocardial infarction and uh, on echo has severe LV dysfunction, uh, but is clinically stable? So the question is, do you proceed with a viability assessment first before doing coronary angiography, or do you do coronary angiography first to guide further management? Uh, great, yeah, good. So, um, you know, uh, <laughs> this is, uh, of course, uh, everybody has very strong beliefs on yeah. this, and uh, it depends if you're in the viability camp or you're not in the viability camp. Personally, you know, um, I, I interpret uh, cardiac MRI, and, uh, you know, um, I'm a, a, a believer uh, that this can have value. So, in this particular case, you know, um, I you know, I, I would feel very comfortable assessing using uh, cardiac MRI or cardiac PET to look for viability uh, to determine whether any further intervention would be necessary. All right. Um, and then before we, we've got just a few more minutes, do you want to wrap up or talk sure. about uh, how are you approaching now these, uh, you know, patients that are presenting with uh, coronavirus uh, sure. COVID-19? So this is all on our minds. Uh, this is, you know, unfortunately um, a, a common com uh, discussion nowadays. And I want to be first to tell you there are some societal guidelines which everybody can review coming out from both the SCCT, SCMR, and ASE. Um, a lot of, you know, uh, I think there is a lot of also in institutional variability. So I don't necessarily have all the answers for you today, but I think there are some um, broad general things that we could discuss uh, where uh, I think that can pertain to most institutions. And you know what, I think the first thing is, you know, um, when you have a patient who's under investigation or who is COVID-19, you know, you really, uh, you know, if, l let's talk about the under patient under investigation. If they are under investigation, can you safely maybe delay the test a day or two? Uh, our institution is able to, uh, has a test where you can um, uh, 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 ch check for COVID-19 uh, with a turnaround in 24 hours. You know, so if you can safely order that, if you ha if you're able to order a test, get a test result. Uh, you know, and that, that's and, and if it's normal, you know, you feel a whole lot more comfortable bringing this patient down to your lab. Um, if you do uh, have, uh, you know, of course, a COVID patient. Then, of course, um, uh, uh, with chest pain, then I think, you know, th this all has to be done on a case-to-case -case basis. This really does require a conversation between the ordering physician and the imager. And there are a couple of things that have to be taken account. You know, can, does this test, is the patient stable? If they're not stable, they should not be coming to the imaging lab. You know, you, you need to do whatever you need to do. If they are stable, then, you know, do they really need the test? Um, you know, uh, can we def safely defer this test? Can we possibly get other information? Uh, could this be another diagnosis? These are all, con you know, situations um, that you need to discuss with the f uh, your physician. If it turns out that it is something, you know, imaging would really help, uh, the, you know, the, uh, help guide patient management, then, you know, there are some common sense th things we should all do. The patient should be wearing a mask when they come uh, to the lab. All the uh, people, healthcare workers who are in contact with these patients should be wearing uh, uh, personal protective equipment uh, in accordance with their institutional policies. Um, um, and, and then you, you know, you really want to choose the test that you can do fast. And, um, um, and then, you know, I, I, I'll put there, consider CT because of its speed and also because if you do have a negative test, the testing will end there for your patient. You know, you can reliably exclude CAD and you will not be bringing this patient down for further imaging. You'll have a definitive yeah. answer. And then finally, you know, once that patient leaves, you know, there is, a, you know, we have to be very, very diligent about the whole cleanup process of both the equipment and uh, um, the facility. So I know these are general statements, but um, uh, these are, you know, I think um, important points we have to bring up. And then a lot of this will be, you know, on a case-to-case -case basis. Yeah, no, I think, uh Okay, actually before we finish here, there's one more question that came in. It says, uh, 
Asymptomatic patients who have a high calcium score, should we proceed with further investigation or not? Uh, and does the location of the calcium have an impact on your decision as far as whether to do anything further or not? So I think that's, I mean, I think this is a very good question. So, you know, in these asymptomatic patients where we do screening, I think obviously your, your first goal in these patients is to simply try to establish do they have coronary disease or not? Do they have atherosclerosis or not? From a management intensification standpoint, the question now, if somebody comes in with a high calcium score, now I'd probably ask you to say, what do you define as high? Is it 400? Is it 1,000? Is it 2,000? And then what do you do in that patient? Do you then do uh, further testing okay. uh, in an asymptomatic patient? I think yeah. that's the other key thing here. Correct. So we have been doing, we've, uh, we, studies have shown in patients with a calcium score greater than 40, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the rate of an abnormal functional study ranges anywhere from 25 to 45%. So a large portion of these patients will uh, likely have silent ischemia, and we have been testing these patients to detect that. Um, that's uh, point number one. We have recently also been suggesting, considering um, uh, testing patients who may have a calcium score greater than 100, about 10% of these patients will also likely have uh, an abnormal functional study especially if the greater the risk profile burden they have. So those who are high metabolic risk kind of patients, those are the kind of patients where you would be more likely to pick up a disease. So um, uh, we, have been, uh, we have been testing and have been suggesting testing, and it is part of the um, SCCT um, appropriate use criteria. Right. All right, well, very good. I think uh, I want to thank you, Faisal, for a, a really outstanding presentation uh, and an outstanding discussion, uh, and also for some of your insights uh, with regard to how to approach uh, patients with, with COVID. As unfortunately, I think we're going to, you know, we're throughout the country and throughout the world, we're seeing more and more of these patients. And the question is really what's the best way to approach this? Uh, I think we're going to continue to learn as time goes on. So thank you very much, and thank you to the audience for a lot of the great, great questions that came in. All right.